Hello, and welcome to the Bayside Sermon Series podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Duckworth, Media and Technical Director here at Bayside. This week, we chat with Pastor Ken Carlson on the topic of Psalm 150, the celebration of praise. We hope you enjoy our conversation today. Thank you. All right, welcome back to the podcast. This week, we are in Psalm 150 with Pastor Ken Carlson. This week, our sermon was titled Celebration of Praise. And coming from the sermon discussion guide, I'm going to read the sermon summary. This sermon titled Celebration of Praise emphasizes the importance of wholeheartedly praising God in every aspect of our lives. It is based on Psalm 150 and focuses on five main points. Praising God alone in every place, for every reason, with every instrument, alongside every person. The sermon emphasizes that praise should permeate our lives and be a constant and joyful activity. Ultimately, the sermon encourages us to live lives saturated in praise and to recognize that every breath is an opportunity for praise. All right, welcome back, Pastor Ken. And as we start our discussion questions, let's quickly read Psalm 150. Do you have that? I do. All right, go ahead. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, Psalm 150 uh, is a collection of psalms that was that had been written over a couple hundred years during the Old Testament times, and various poets from David and Solomon, and even Moses had some uh, psalms. They expressed a vast range of human emotions and the roller coaster of human experiences. And so a couple of questions that you asked is, why is Psalm 150 such a fitting conclusion? And then which Hebrew word was emphasized in this sermon and the significance of that particular word? And if we remember from this, the, the sermon, the Hebrew word for the week was halal. And this word is often used as part of the phrase translated into English, praise the Lord from Hallelujah. Uh, and historically, we don't know who wrote this particular psalm. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, it's not. Um, they generally just uh, unattributed. All right. Um, yep. So, uh, but all the people who gathered these psalms felt that this one was a crescendo or a zenith or a pinnacle uh, as a way to conclude the hymnal because it uh, commands all to praise the Lord. Yeah, and exactly. And... Um, it's a com- right. It's a command. It's a celebration. This this last uh, last psalm and the the whole idea of the range, the wide range of human emotions and experiences, the ups and downs, the great times, the awful times. Because um, you see that obviously in in so many of the psalms, there's so many ups and downs. It's just it's so true to what um, we um, live through. Uh, in a fallen world. And yet, um, it ends on a note of celebration and hope and praise, um, knowing that um, it's it's all going to end in worship and praise. It's all going to be okay. Um, and I think there's, I think that's a, a significant reason um, why Psalm 150 in particular ends um, all of the the, the whole Psalter, you know, the whole, all the, the books of the Psalms, um, originally five, five, five books. Um, so that whole idea of, uh, hey, no matter what's going on, no matter how bad life is, you, there, of course, you have to lament. There are times where it's, it's going to be so grievous, but even in the lamenting, even in the grief, even in the pain, even in the difficulty, there's still opportunity for praise. Um, 
So I, I kind of think there's uh, there's intentionality there with ending the, the psalms with this particular psalm. Now in the sermon, you discuss that the psalmist declares, praise the Lord to reinforce the truth that there is no one else who deserves praise but him. And one thing that comes to mind for me is growing up in a, in a traditional uh, Midwestern church is that we would quite often sing what's called a doxology. That's right. And I'm not going to sing it, but I will say it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. So there is actually a part of me that if I was maybe a little more confident or comfortable or didn't make didn't care about looking like a fool, <laughs> I was a part of me was actually going to sing that uh, to to lead lead that at the end of the sermon or at some point in the sermon to see how many people would actually mm-hmm. then join in. Um, because right, it, traditionally in you know in um, more traditional services or uh, I'll say liturgical services, um, it is common to. Uh, at, one point uh, toward the end of the sermon or around the offering um you know do the the doxology um everybody just sings that that one phrase and that's kind of the the way you leave um and somebody starts it and then kind of everybody joins in and, and sings it uh there were no it's not like there were you know words on a screen for that one um so yeah, it's a that's such a, a, a beautiful uh, beautiful thing, and I, I honestly I love when I love being in a, a church setting too, uh, being in those congregations. You know, when you get to visit those congregations, or even when I get to guest preach at them, when everybody's singing the doxology, um, that's it, it. Really, is a cool thing. Hey, maybe it's something that we'll do here one day. Sounds like a good thing to invest in. So you also asked for some examples in our own lives where focusing on God's praise has helped us to grow in faith. One thing that comes to mind for me is about a decade ago, um, my family went through some very difficult times for about two or three years. And my wife in particular was having difficulties getting to sleep because of the pressures of life. Mm. And what helped was I would actually read on average five psalms each night over her as as we try to go to sleep. And um, it, it actually helped to soothe and to calm her and allow her the rest that she needed during those times. Uh, And there's just something about the Word of God that can bring an immense peace even in the worst times. Yeah, there is. That's that's great. Thank you for sharing that, Marcus. Um, It's so encouraging to hear that. Um, There absolutely is, I think, maintaining a uh, an attitude of praise. It's obviously hard. It's hard to do in the difficult times. Um, I mean, you don't always feel like praising, mm-hmm. um, but it's especially when you go against what you're feeling um, to to do right, to be true. There's there's joy off, oftentimes in that. Uh, you know, for me, I think just even an example of just a few years ago was um, 20, was it 2020? Yeah, 2020 when I got sick. Um so many different doctors. I was out for a couple months. Nobody knew what was going on, and um, it just yeah, man, I don't know how much, how much I racked up in total, like in bills from the doctors and stuff. But it was it was such a scary time because it was going from doctor to doctor to doctor and test test test. I was poked and prodded and scanned so many different ways. Um, we heard everything from um, cancer to uh, to MS um, and. You know, nothing and nothing ended up coming of any of those um, ended up, you know, just being something with my pituitary gland, hypopituitarism. But um, that whole time was really scary, losing losing weight, rapid weight, fast. I couldn't eat. I mean, we had no idea what was going on. And Laura heard cancer and all the things looked like cancer, all the, the symptoms. And it's, um, it was a it was a scary time, obviously. But in those moments, still praising, trusting God. Um that he's he knows what's good and uh, he is worthy of praise not only because of his mighty deeds but because of his excellent greatness which again is um, an emphasis in that psalm praise God in his sanctuary praise him in his mighty heavens and then he says why do you praise him well he says praise him for his mighty deeds 
right, for everything he does, but not only for everything he does, also for who he is, because you praise him according to his excellent greatness. So he's great even when it feels like our lives aren't. Um, so yeah, being able to praise in that. And Marcus, you said you, when you were in your example with Taya, expressed the value of reading Psalms or reading the scripture uh, in, in those times. Um, there's a, a great app uh, that I have called uh, Abide, mm-hmm. um, and I highly recommend that to if anybody's uh, you know kind of in that same spot, you know, just having a hard time or hard time sleeping, whatever. Um, Abide is an app that uh, will walk through Abide and Dwell. They're actually two different apps, um, but they are they will both walk through Scripture. Um, it's light Scripture reading with light music. You could choose different books of the Bible, um, different topics. Uh, Some of them, one of those apps even has like some like Christian stories, like in like a nice like meditation kind of, um, hey, let's put you to sleep and let me pray God's blessings over you. It really is such a beautiful thing. And um, my girls have gone to sleep uh, with that many times uh, when they were having um, nightmares or whatever. I've gone to sleep with it many times when I just, my brain is just going and going and going and doesn't stop at night. Um, so there is something very, uh, very powerful, very joyful um, about engaging the Psalms that way and hearing from God uh, and allowing him to reorient um, your your feelings and your thoughts toward his purposes. Absolutely. The third point uh, in the sermon, uh, you had mentioned that there is no time, place or activity that is outside the boundaries of praise and it should permeate every aspect of our life and um, uh, and some specific ways that we can incorporate praise into our daily routine or activities. Um, one side note is uh, for me it's very difficult to speak poorly of others if we keep the praises of the Lord on our lips uh, and that I do find myself praising the Lord quite often on the, the Garden State Parkway especially anywhere north of Berkeley. <laughs> that's that's true. It's If I'm praising the Lord, I have less time to curse out the guy in the left lane in front of me. <laughs> Just kidding, I don't do that. Not anymore. <laughs> but that's it. All right, point four. Uh, the sermon emphasizes that we should praise God for his mighty deeds, and as we talked about, a moment ago, his excellent greatness. So not just for for who he is, but uh, what he does and who he is. Uh, and um, some of the things about God's character and his deeds that make him worthy of his praise. And when we look at these things and think about his greatness, sharing those things uh, about what God has done, specifically in our lives, uh, is part of our testimony. Yeah, the Old Testament doesn't just cut out the, the ways that God corrected and, and brought up his people. It, it became part of how he redeemed them through Christ, which reminds me of another Hebrew word. In English, it can mean unfailing love, his hesed. Uh, it's, a, it's a love that will never let go. And if we take a moment to try and grasp the concept of a, of a love that God has for us, how could we not praise him with every breath? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, what, seeing his his mighty deeds in history is absolutely amazing. Um, you know, if you if you read a you know a history book or whatever, and you're amazed at uh, you know a certain the the way someone ruled or or the way uh, you know so, someone led their their kingdom, their military. Um, that's that's pretty cool. But you get to see the way God did that with a whole nation um, and then the way he does that with an entire people. And it's not just, Hey, we're, I'm going to do these mighty deeds for this nation. That's, you know, far removed from you. Look at what I could do. It's no, I'm doing this for them. So I could do this for you in the person of Jesus. Um, So I love that. I love that, uh, that dynamic um, where it's, you have the, the transcendence of God, um, you know, he's he, he's totally um, powerful and, and beyond uh, everything and anything. But then you have 
You have the imminence of God. He's right here. He's right. He's present with us at every moment. He cares so personally, so deeply, and he's going to do mighty deeds, not only for the entire nation of Israel, but he's going to do a mighty deed for you personally. Um, that's, that's just such an amazing thought. All right. Point five. The psalmist lists various musical instruments, emphasizing that God should be praised in every possible manner, uh, that each person has a unique role to play in God's praise team. And uh, what we would like for, for the people that are listening and the discussion groups to think about the, the gifts and talents that, that you have that you can use to praise God and, and how you might be able to, to use them. You know, as we think about all the ministries that we have here at Bayside, what are some meaningful ways to serve as an act of worship? We, we constantly have requests for people to help in the child care areas uh, with the kids club the youth, and even if working with people isn't really your thing, uh, if you're here for the 11 o'clock service, helping stack a few chairs. So it's not all uh, spiritual helps or emotional helps. So it's physical things that we need here a- as well, where if you have the ability to, to do it, it's always a way of helping to praise God. Yeah, there's... Um... There's an, an element there, right? Praise him with every instrument where I wanted to <clears throat> emphasize the fact that, you know, we all do bring different um, talents, different gifts um, that we praise God with. Um, but what that requires is for, for some people, at least, is to just discovering what your spiritual gift is. Um, some people don't even know that. You know, it's not – it could be something that we, we're not even – we're not even doing. You know, you may have the gift of hospitality. Well, we run out of classrooms to have groups. So if you have the gift of hospitality but not the gift of teaching, you could just simply offer it up and say, hey, here's my house. I'd love to have a Bible study meet here. We'll connect you. We'll find somebody to lead a Bible study there. That simple act like that, just opening yourself up, that's, if you have the gift of hospitality, that's a spiritual gift. You're using your instrument uh, in uh, uh, to praise God, to praise God, to bring him glory by um, discipling, using your house for, for discipleship. So these are all different, um, all different ways. Of, there's so many different ways that you can get connected and to serve. Um, but I really loved about these few verses in particular um, was the diversity, um, the diversity of instruments. Uh, there was definitely some intentionality in the listing of the instruments here because um, the different instruments listed were played. Uh, very often by different types of people. I mentioned um, on Sunday, trumpet was uh, blown by the priests, the lute and harp were played by the Levites, tambourines were played by the women as they were dancing, and then you had other instruments that were uh, invitations for everyone else to join. Um, And then people used their voices. Everybody's got a voice. Um, People uh, people danced, people clapped, people lifted their hands. Uh, You know, part of what we the way um, you know some of our saints worship and express praise physically uh, here on Sunday, um, so the whole diversity um, of of gifting, you know, just because you see a few people up on the platform on Sunday playing an actual instrument, um, you know, oftentimes it's like, oh, that's that that public position, like, oh, that's su- such a cool thing. I wish I could do that. Like, that's not any more needed than somebody who's serving in the nursery. Um, or opening up their house for a Bible study. Um, there are so many, so many opportunities to use your instrument to bring praise and glory to God. So whatever it is, God wants you to play it wholeheartedly with confidence. He doesn't, he doesn't want you to let your, your instrument remain silent. All right, point six. The sermon concludes with the reminder that everyone should praise God and that every breath is an opportunity for praise. Uh, the example you gave for that was uh, the quote you brought about Yahweh being uh, that that physical representative of several breaths in and out. Uh, I'm I'm not able to do that very well. If you could show us that example again. Yeah. So the idea being um, that the name itself uh, for uh, Lord uh, there when, when you see capital um, all uppercase L O R D um, that's translation of. Um, of Yahweh, basically, and but the the sound, the idea being that the, the name of God itself, Yahweh, when pronounced, is like the sound of breathing. So, the breathe in sounds like Yah, and then the exhale 
sounds like way. So Yahweh. Um, so the idea that every breath you take, you're speaking God's name. Since all breath comes from God then, and his very name can only be pronounced by breath, the psalmist commands, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Now, the question you ask here is how can constant praise improve our dependence on God? And one of the things I feel that our culture struggles with is giving praise to a higher authority. And depending on that higher authority uh, has become a foreign idea in in our Western culture. We are self-made individuals who not only want independence but despise authority. How can we get over some of those things? That's a <laughs> that's true, um, and that's I think true praise is um, true halal praise is a dependent praise. Um, you're you're it's it's a boasting um, in in God in who He is and what He's done. Um, so. That could own that kind of boasting, that kind of praise can only come, um, or best comes from a place of um, knowing that there's nothing in myself to boast about. Mm. There's nothing in myself praiseworthy. Mm. Um, that requires humility. Humility is key for dependence. Um, so, so, um, so yeah, I think true halal worship is a dependent worship, uh, dependent praise. Um, but I think getting into simply the the habit of of praising um, more often. So you know, it's, it's doing something small. Um, if you what do you listen to in the car? If you don't listen to anything, or if you listen to the news, or if you listen to um, podcasts, make a decision to spend fifteen minutes listening to praise music. Um, spend fifteen minutes listening to an audio bible. Um, it, it really there there are so many different ways just to start um you know wake up in the morning instead of reaching for your phone like 99 percent of us do um and i'm just as guilty of it you know 90 percent of the time you know, reaching for your phone in the morning um you know, we're at the place where we're putting our phones in and in a different room um just kind of to be completely separate from it and you know instead of reaching for your phone first thing reach for the bible or reach for the phone and open up the Bible app and that's it. <laughs> and, you know, spend five minutes there. Just start with those little habits. And the more and more you do that, the more you're going, your, your knee jerk reaction to life is going to be one of praise. Um, and God's going to honor that. And, and what you're doing with those moments when you're uh, committing that time to praise God is you're expressing dependence on him. Um, that that's part of our praise is what we're expressing our dependence. So I think the more we do that, the more we do tend to rely um, on God. And it's, it, again, it, Marcus, it's not like, like you had alluded to. It's not that superficial, um, you know, there's a higher power out there, um, you know, or, you know, praise him, praise that person. Um, but it's such, it, it's, it's uh, such a deeply personal, uh, intimate praise that's born out of a personal relationship. All right, so as we come to the close of our time, uh, as we, we started last week with Pastor Dave, I wanted to talk about where the gospel presentation is in this week's message. Because at Bayside, again, uh, we're made up of people of different points in their spiritual walk, and it's important that each of us know every time they open the Bible, it points to the saving power of the gospel. Uh, so from the message in psalm 150 where can we find jesus and the saving power of the gospel yeah great uh, great question um so in my sermon i brought it out um in a couple spots um in praise god for his mighty deeds um obviously his <laughs> greatest deed was um the incarnation of his uh, eternal son um so that's clearly the the greatest deed that we express uh, praise to God for. Um, I think I also alluded to it at least in one um, of the sermons when he has the whole list of instruments there. Um, the very first one listed is the trumpet. Um, that's the you know, the shofar. Um, that's their the the trumpet. I mean that that shofar sound, that trumpet sound was. Uh, used for lots of things, you know, to signal the arrival of 
um, a dignitary, but also it's kind of that, it was a wartime sound uh, as well. So it's the, that trumpet sound is the first sound that um, allows for the rest of the continued praise um, and the rest of the continued instruments. And I think in a very, um, that, that, that pictures um, a future reality of um, that final trumpet blast. Um, when, you know, with uh, Matthew 24, uh, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they'll gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So that that trumpet blast, I think, is going to be that uh, that first call for ushering into um, eternal praise um, when all the rest of the instruments will join in. Uh, so that that's one way. Uh, another another way we see Christ in there. But um, something in particular is when it says praise God in his sanctuary as well. Um you know, and we're in the new covenant, um, sealed with by, by the blood of Christ. Um, we're not under the law; we're under grace. Um, so, in the in our new covenant, um, you know, I talked about the sanctuary being wherever the, the the saints are, and that's true. That's that's the church. That's the sanctuary. Um, also, our bodies, uh, our Hebrews eight, uh, called it a temple, um, but. Where you see Christ in particular uh, in this is uh, in how, the way Jesus serves his people. Jesus serves his people uh, in, a, in a sanctuary in the heavens. In uh, Hebrews 8, let me pull that up, it says, Now this is the main point of the things we're saying. We have a high priest who's seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tab, uh, tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Um, so you're seeing right there that Jesus uh, is the sanctuary. He, he, he serves his people in a sanctuary in the heavens. Um, he makes his sanctuary among his people uh, collectively. You see that in uh, 2 Corinthians 6, um, 2 Corinthians 6, 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So again, Jesus has made his sanctuary uh, uh, among us. Um, tabernacled so, with us. Yeah, exactly. Tabernacled with us, right? Uh, John 1. Um, yeah, I love that. I love that. I can't wait till we get to, to John 1 for the... Uh, Christmas sermon series. Um, but yeah, ultimately, Jesus himself um, is a sanctuary. Uh, he makes a sanctuary in the individual believer. He, he dwells among in his sanctuary collectively. Um, but also, again, looking forward to the future, ultimately, Jesus himself will be the sanctuary of God among people. Um, Revelation 21, 22, but I saw no temple in it, no sanctuary, nothing, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, its sanctuary. So, amen to that. Amen. All right. Well, that's going to conclude our time this week. Uh, next week, we have Pastor James Carson preaching from Psalm 63. So, there's something to look forward to for the next podcast. Uh, and we'll have to take it easy on Pastor James because he doesn't do this very often. Thank you, Pastor Ken, for your time. Thank you. And we hope you all have a blessed week. Thank you for joining our conversation today.